Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. It's Tuesday, 5.30 US Mountain Time, when I usually have a live stream, so welcome. Let's see who is in the chat already. Looks like we have several people here. Thanks for waiting. Um, Elaine Smith is in the house and says, wow, another q and I learned a lot from these. Good, glad to hear it. Animal Kingdom, hello. And Gordius, hello, hello, hello. Lots of hellos. Nice. Oh, we have 10 people in the house. Five likes already. Not bad at all for a beginning. The Nature Show. Hi. Welcome. And Potato Derp. I actually caught the stream this time. Nice. And Robert Gear finally back. Chris Waite, what's up? Welcome all. Nice. I think this might be a record. We have 14 and 8 likes already. Roger's Aquarium says, hi Russ. Hi Roger and welcome. So, what's up everyone? I'm, I have a few things I want to say. If you have any questions you want to just jump out with, that's fine. You can start out that way. Uh, I would like to mention that I have been working on my frog vivarium build and I have encountered a problem with lighting. The lighting for my old vivarium is not going to be strong enough. I have uh, Jungle Dawn bulbs. They're, I believe, the 9 watt, which work great for my 20 gallon high, but they're not going to work for my 29. And I am looking for bulbs and they are, they tend to be out of stock. Gordea says that isopod vid must have attracted some attention. It did indeed. Got some, uh, it has a fair number of views for only having been out for, what is it, like five days now? It, it did pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. It has over 100 likes and I think around, somewhere around 800 views, am I right? 700 views? I don't know. But it, yeah, it did pretty well. I was excited about that. So, um, G Giselle? Giselle Moraga says, hello, welcome. Nice to have you here. Jesus Villanueva says, ooh, hold on, check in the chat. I have a baby painted turtle that won't eat anything I give it. Hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about the setup for your baby painted turtle. Uh, what is the temperature? What is the situation? Uh, what is the water side of its vivarium like? What is the land side like? Um, what kind of lighting and, and so on? What are you using to heat it? And the nature so says, who dislikes the stream didn't even start. Hmm, yeah. Some people just do that, and that's cool. I, if they dislike it, I wish they would tell me why. Um, that would be helpful. But, uh, yeah, sometimes people do that. I don't know why. Animal Kingdom, number one, says, is your mantis still alive? Unfortunately, no. And uh, I talked about that in the live stream a couple of, when was that? Two or three live streams ago, maybe? I talked about that. Um, I was pretty sad. Um, we think it may have been a problem relating to molting. Uh, it looked like it was trying to mold and didn't make it. So that is a very sad thing. I, I definitely want to try that species again. I really like mantids and I've kept them before successfully, but this one I wanted to try to raise from very small all the way to adulthood and I didn't make it with that one. So I'm going to try again at some point. I'm not sure when yet, but it was really sad. Potato Derp says, do buffalo beetles do better in a moist environment or more arid environment? They seem pretty adaptable, but I think somewhat on the drier side, when I kept them on dry cocoa fiber but provided um, water crystals and vegetables, they did really well. So I would say very, very, very similar to mealworms, although they might be a little bit more adaptable that way than mealworms are. And Jesus Villanueva says, 10 gallon tank, I got it from a pond, UV light. Okay, and what is the temperature? Do you have a a reading on the temp the water temperature and the land temperature. Um, it sounds like the 10 gallon tank for a small one will be okay while it's a baby. And the UV light is a good thing. They do benefit greatly from UV light, but uh, the temperature of the water is gonna be key as well. The Animal Kingdom one says, that happened to one of the mantises, fell off the stick while melting and died. Yeah, yeah, not a good thing. Uh, that seems to be one of the ways that people lose mantises the most. And Potato Derp says, those people who automatically dislike are just trolls trying to ruin your day. Just ignore them. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mostly do. Um, if someone really has a complaint, I'd like to know about it. But if they're just trying to troll, then uh, I don't need to worry about it at all. That's a good point. Robert Gear says, so I started collecting isopods from my yard. Would it be safe to use them in a vivarium? Okay. Well, there are a couple of things. If you're using it in a vivarium to keep with other animals... Um, then I would suggest it's not um, not necessarily the best idea to use wild caught um, if for two reasons. One is possible um, introduction of parasites or other pests 
the further you have the isopods removed generationally from the wild, the less likely that is. Not to say that it's, you're completely eliminating the possibility, but you are reducing it. And then another one is that isopods tend to collect heavy metals in their carapaces. And so I don't know what sort of heavy metal makeup there is in your area, but if, you know, sometimes in uh, populated areas, there is uh, the possibility of heavy metal buildup, and then that can be transferred onto whatever eats them in your vivarium. So uh, those two reasons uh, indicate uh, that you could uh, benefit from allowing them to breed and any babies they have on the, the substrate that you control, you're going to reduce the likelihood of the um, heavy metal accumulation and you're also going to reduce the likelihood of any kind of parasite or pest. Because at least if the pests are present, you'll, you'll likely notice them as you're culturing them and be able to do something about it. But there are people that do it and it seems to work for them. I've heard of people doing it and, you know, sometimes it works. TMPS says, hello, hello, sorry I missed a few live streams. No problem, but glad you are back. And, oh, TMPS brings up the idea of isopods accumulating metals in their bodies as well. And Jesus Villanueva says 70. Ah, okay. I would suggest that 70 is probably not going to be uh, the optimal temperature for your a little turtle to eat. You'll want to create a gradient where the turtle can bask and warm up um, on the land and then have the water maybe a little warmer if you're... Um, getting like 75 in the water and then a basking point where it can get a little warmer, it's more likely to want to eat. That should help to some degree. Okay. TMPS says, have you ever seen any maple oniscus acellus rusts? I have seen pictures. I've never seen any among my own. I would really like, I really like that uh, variety. And the, the maple oniscus acellus are basically the equivalent of an orange, like a giant orange isopod, something like that but they are, um, they are aniscus acellus. So they have the coloration that an aniscus does with the skirt and the little flex, but it's orange. It's a really cool effect. And I believe it was called maple because a Canadian hobbyist was the one who isolated them. And so in honor of the Canadian flag, they were, they were called maple aniscus. Um, so I've seen pictures. They look really cool. I've never owned one. I would love to get some someday, though. I really like uh, Oniscus acellus. They're a fun isopod. But the orange coloration would be really cool. Potato Derp says, I started a native isopod colony a few days ago, and I already have babies. I'm not sure what kind, but they are large, gray with white marks, and love a wet environment. Those may well be Oniscus acellus. It sounds, sounds likely. Do they have kind of a skirt around the edges with sort of little spikes? TMPS has been trying to find some, and I think I found some, but they're pretty small. Okay, cool. Um, do you know what species they might be? It, it's okay. I mean, there are so many different types uh, that you could find. And if you found babies and they're small, you know, you can always raise them up. Generally, there are a few native species in the U.S. that are really small. But I'm not sure exactly where you are either. So, Michael Hatcher says, I have a 20-gallon tall tank. And I would like to know if a pair of Alto Sumbu or Black Speciosus would work alongside a Julitochromus. Uh, so the Alto Lamprologus, hmm, 20 gallon tall tank, just one Julitochromus, like not a pair? I'm, I'm going to say that I think there's some risk there, but probably less risk with an individual than with a pair of Julitochromus, because if the Julitochromus were spawning in there, and you had the uh, Alto Lamprologus in there, you'd probably have a worse problem one way or the other. I hope you all aren't hearing the airplane as much as I am <laughs> because there are a lot of them flying over uh, today and uh, I hope it's not interfering with you hearing me. Okay, and Jesus Villanueva says, I bought turtle baby food and I bought red worms. Okay, are they live red worms? Those, that can help, but I, I'm thinking the temperature would, would definitely help if it's increased a little bit. You don't want to go too much, but you want to have that gradient so the turtle has a place to cool off place to warm up and it can find the perfect temperature where it wants to eat. The Animal Kingdom says, so my mantises live in 32 ounce cups with eco-earth and cork bark flat. Should I keep dwarf white isopods? What are the cons? Okay. I think, I think so. Uh, I think you'd be okay keeping them. The only cons are that um, if the isopods are of a size where the dwarf whites look interesting, they might eat them. Let's see what else. Dwarf whites shouldn't really bother the mantises while they're molting since mantises hang, tend to hang from the ceiling to mold. 
So that's uh, we're probably okay there. I, the pros are basically they're going to help clean up. They will eat the molts. They will eat uh, bits of insects if there are any, you know, wings and stuff that fall to the bottom. Um, they will most likely eat the um, frass of the mantis as well. And um, that would, yeah, I guess that, those would summarize the benefits. So that would help keep the substrate cleaner. Okay, so Potato Derp says they do have spikes around the edges. They are probably Aniscus acellus. And you welcome Jesus, no problem, hope that helps. And Michael Hatcher says, yes, just one, but I'm afraid I have lost track of what the original one was. Um, I'm just trying to scroll back and see what's going on. But that's not working for me, I'm not finding it. Okay, ah, just, just one, the Julitochromus and the Altolampologus. Um, let's see. I would say there's some risk there. I'm not going to say it's not going to work, but uh, it would be a little risky. But if you just have one, it's better. you do have a better chance. So TMPS, any pics you could send to me? Um, yeah, actually, if you go to Aquarimax.com um, and you, if you just do a search for Aquarimax isopods, you'll probably get some of my videos to come up. And if you look at, uh, you watch the isopod video, the 19 types of isopods, you'll see a lot of different types, 19 different types. Um, but I also have on my website, aquariumx.com, uh, a page with pictures. So Aquariumx isopods and then just look for aquariumx.com. And you can see a pictures of quite a few species. It's not current. I haven't updated in a while. But some of the more common species are there and that might help too. Okay. So TMPS says, I'm having trouble IDing any other species. My little maple isopods might be. So hopefully I can raise them up and or find larger individuals. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I hope so. And Jesus Villanueva says, you need a TV show. That would be cool. You're very knowledgeable. Yes to the red worms. Okay, so they're live. That's helpful. If they're of an appropriate size, you know, if they, if they look too big to the turtle, some turtles will attack something bigger and bite off pieces and others are less comfortable doing that. So um, if that, that may be an issue. Some things that you can use to entice your turtle to eat some some different things you can try at that size you if you have a pelleted food and you've tried red worms which i assume you mean red worms like the red wigglers not blood worms or something like that um, you can try various types of frozen foods you can try something that is going to wiggle a lot um, if those worms are wiggling but they're too big that you know that might be something that's turning off the the turtle some some will go after snails some turtles i had a turtle that really loves snails it was a red-eared slider it wasn't a painted turtle but appropriately sized ones with fairly thin shells so it can crunch them up easily those are some things that might get it to eat robert gear said so i ended up buying an asian forest scorpion any care tips hmm well that's one i've looked into myself a little bit i haven't kept one but i have uh you know, limited experience handling one. Um, that's about it. I wish I, I could uh, tell you more. Apparently, they're pretty easy and a very laid-back scorpion. Um, but I wish I had more for you there. Potato Derp says, <laughs> "How the snarf do you pronounce Hyrodula membranacea?" Um, however you want, really. I mean. Uh, it depends on how Latinate you want to get, if you want to really sound Latinate or if you want to sound more Americanized or whatever. But uh, I think a lot of people would say Hyrodula membranacea. And that is the species of mantis that I had recently. Okay, Michael Hatcher said, do you have an Instagram for your YouTube account? You know what? I need to. I really ought to get one. I don't have one yet. People ask me that all the time and I need to do it. So... Thank you for the reminder. I'll try to get on that. Um, Robert Gear says, also, would Oniscus Acellus be able to have a cleanup crew for the scorpion? Hmm, that is a good question. Oniscus are big enough that they might be of interest as a food item for an Asian forest scorpion. Um, that could be a problem, possibly. I would say a smaller isopod might be a better option just for that reason. I'm not going to say it's not going to work for sure. Um, the forest scorpions do like a little humidity too, and oniscus like humidity, but I might try something a little smaller like a Porcilio scabber, or even something smaller like a Venezillo um, 
isopod, what else? Even the jungle micropods could be good in that case. The Animal Kingdom one says, when I go on your website, it says the website is not secure and the website has an unsupported tool. You know, I can fix that. Ooh, I'm going to have to check that out. I'm sorry about that. Unsupported cipher protocol. Hmm, let me look into that. Um, I will do that as soon as I can. Uh, that is weird. Um, that's never happened to me before that I know of, so I'll look into that because I don't want the website down and, you know, unsupported. That's, that's a bad thing. The Nature Show says, I've heard that Asian forest scorpions like to eat mealworms. Hmm. And Krista Lewis says, yes, they will eat mealworms. I've been researching them this week. Cool. Yeah, my, uh, not that this is the same thing, but my, my vinegaroons love mealworms. And so do our centipedes. They like them a lot. Yeti Grant, welcome. Crystal Lewis is back too, so welcome to both of you. Um, Michael Hatcher says, have you had any experience with Alto Sumbu? If so, what can you recommend? Um, I haven't really had a lot. I have uh, researched Tanganyikan cichlids and kept a few species, so I know a little bit about Alto Lamprologus and you know a few different types. I don't know a lot of specifics. Um, just what I have heard is that um, keeping them with Julitochromus in such a small tank might not work, but yeah, I wish I had more information for you. Potato Derp says, I'm getting two Hyrogula membranacea nymphs in the mail sometimes this week, possibly tomorrow. Awesome. That is cool. They, I really enjoyed having mine, and oh, I really hope to do it again. They're just, it was so, um, such a fun creature. It was so, uh, Fun to hold, fun to watch it eat. Everything was amazing about it. The way it would do its little dance was cool. So, and Crystal Lewis waves. I lurk off and on. <laughs> and Animal Kingdom one says, are dwarf purple isopods also called dwarf gray isopods? Um, you know, there's a little confusion on that particular point. The dwarf purples are sometimes called Costa Rican purples and jungle micropods. The dwarf gray is a name that I have heard applied to the Trichorina tomentosa and um, some other species as well. So I think sometimes that common name is used and there's you know, some of the confusion. And one really especially difficult thing is that dwarf purples don't have a scientific species and genus name, they just have a family, a Trichoniscidae is, is all we've got. And so that adds to the confusion. So my answer to your question, the Animal Kingdom one, is probably sometimes, but not exclusively. Okay. Elaine Smith says, mealworms breed fast. My problem is sorting and cleaning. Tiny ones pass through the screen. Yeah, they do. My uh, solution has been to um, sieve everything out and sieve the, uh, the frass into a small container, into another container, a separate container, other than the one I'm putting the larger mealworms into. And then to feed that container, especially things like slices of uh, sweet potato, something like that, so that the tiny worms are attracted to it. And after a week or so, they're big enough that I can see them better. And it's not too long after that that I can sieve them out of the old uh, frass and um, detritus. And then um, I have, you know, two cultures basically, or I can put them in the, the main culture either way. But I've gotten them out of the frass, and because they were so tiny when I put them in, there aren't any adult beetles laying eggs in that new stuff, so I'm not really wasting any if I dump that frass finally after having allowed it to sit a little while and let the eggs hatch out first. It's a good way to, to um, make sure you're preserving as many eggs as possible. All right, so Giselle Moraga, I hope I'm saying your name right. I thought I had isopods, but they're actually sea fleas. Okay, well, actually sea fleas is a name that's often applied to amphipods, which are a relative of isopods. So you're not too far off. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's applied to certain types of isopods as well. But um, amphipods are often called sea fleas, sand fleas, because there are some tidal amphipods or some coastal amphipods that live right on the beach. The ones that, that hop around, those are crustaceans just like isopods, but amphipods. So um, let's see. Mr. Snake says, hey, my eastern ribbon snake has snake fungal disease and it has skin lesions and I can't take it to the vet. Do you think there is any way to treat it at home? Wow. Oh, that's a scary thing. I would say, first of all, um, that is a pretty serious issue. I wish you could 
take it to the vet because um, ooh, that, that can be problematic. Um, but I would say the first thing I would do is, is look at the husbandry and see why it has that. Is there something about the substrate that is too damp? Because that generally is what causes skin fungus or skin blisters on snakes. Uh, it can be that the substrate is not allowing the snake to dry out when it needs to. Ribbon snakes like to soak, and they should be able to soak, but they should also be able to dry out completely. And any substrate that causes them to be constantly moist can cause that problem. So that would be the first thing that I would look at. Is there uh, an issue with your substrate where it's too damp all the time? Vexing Cat, welcome back, says, do you like any arachnids? Yeah, I do. Um, I actually have several. Uh, right now I have tailless whip scorpions, one of my favorite arachnids. I have vinegaroons, another one of my favorite arachnids. And I also have a Phidippus audax, which is a uh, bold jumping spider. So, yeah, I, there are other arachnids I like as well, but those are some of the ones that I actually keep right now, and I, I really enjoy them. They're a lot of fun. I'm going to be breeding my, um, my tailless whip scorpions, my daemon diadema, uh, soon, hopefully. The Animal Kingdom number one says, do dwarf gray isopods require the same care as dwarf white isopods? Essentially, yeah. They'll both do well in similar setups. I don't really uh, use different setups for them, and they, they tend to do well. Um, let's see. Oh, I've lost the chat. Sorry. Um, Michael Hatcher says, with a 20-gallon tank, which shell do I work with a julitochromus? Okay, I have done this. I've done a 20-gallon tall tank with a pair of julitochromus and... Uh, shell dwellers. The only shell dweller I've tried it with are the multis, multifasciatus. It worked pretty well. Uh, it doesn't always work. It worked for my particular situation. I had basically one pair and fry from the multis, and then I had um, the pair of julitochromus in there. A lot of rock work for the julitochromus, some shells in the corners for the uh, for the multis. In fact, maybe I had a trio in there, a reverse trio of shell dwellers. It seemed to work. They would, they would scuffle kind of often, but they didn't damage each other. Worked pretty well. Um, I'm not going to say it's always going to work, but it worked for me in that particular setup. Crystal Lewis says, I've got dwarf whites coming tomorrow, provided I do well with them. I want to get oranges later. Actually, really excited about them again, thanks to your videos. Well, that's nice to hear. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And yeah, they ought to do pretty well for you. The main difference between dwarf whites and oranges, I would say, is temperature. Dwarf whites tend to breed faster when it's a little warmer, and the oranges um, don't necessarily need that warmth to breed uh, pretty fast. But they're not going to breed as fast as the dwarf whites. But yeah, that's fun. I'm really glad to hear that. So you're welcome, Elaine. And Potato Derp says, I have 10 gallon tanks set up for my little mantises. I really like how they chase after the food instead of ambushing their prey like other mantids. That, that was one of the things that attracted me to them, actually. A really strong um, hunting instinct and the, the fact that they do pursue their prey. I, I think that's really cool. I actually have some footage of mine doing that. I've never released it. I kind of didn't have the heart to after my mantis passed away, but I might do that at some point. It, they're amazing hunters. Jack Bordeaux says, hello and welcome. Welcome back. Potato Derp says, I'm pretty excited. I've heard that Hyrodula membranacea is much more active and exciting than Chinese mantises. Not to mention, Hyrodula membranacea is enormous. Yeah, the fact that they get bigger, that they can sometimes have an interesting golden color, and that they're pretty active, all of those were definitely selling points for me. Vexing Cat says, Phidippus audax. I love the face on the back. Me too. Uh, and, and the face on the front. You get two cute little faces in one spider. That's, that's one of the cool things about them. Giselle Moraga says, can I change the seawater to normal drinking water for sea fleas? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm looking at another comment too and laughing. Uh, sorry. Um, the Nature Show... Oh, sorry, Giselle, I'm still answering your question. I don't think so. I think um, sea fleas still need at least some um, salt in their water. They may be able to handle um, different salinity levels like brackish water, but I don't think they can handle just just fresh. Pretty sure that that's the case. But there are species of amphipods, terrestrial amphipods, completely terrestrial amphipods, that can live in uh, a terrarium with no salt at all. Well, I can't say it's completely devoid of salt, but just normal levels of, uh, like a normal vivarium where you're not adding any, any uh, salt to it. There are species like that. 
So the Nature Show says, how did you just say Taylor Swift Scorpion? You know, you're not the first to have said that. It kind of sounds like that, so I can't blame you. Tailless whip scorpion. In other words, they don't have a tail, and they, they have whips and scorpions. So, tailless whip scorpion. Robert Gear says, okay, my scorpion is in a 10-gallon tank already set up for plants. Any recommendations for hardy plants? I do know he will burrow, so I'm prepared to remove the plants if necessary. Okay, well, as far as hardy plants go, you might try some really low-light uh, plants like uh, some of the common philodendron would be a good one to work on. It doesn't grow as fast as the pothos, so that might be good, but it's it's fairly low light. Um, let's see, what else could you do in there that does well with fairly subdued light? Hmm. I'll have to think about that, but that's that's my first recommendation. I'd try the, some of the normal philodendron. And then depending on how much lighting you have in there, how much you're prepared to put in there, um, that, that's definitely a hardy plant. Another hardy one would be a snake plant. You get one of the lower growing ones in a 10 gallon tank. You'd have to get one of the Hanai or another low growing cultivar that doesn't, it's not going to try to burst through the, the top of the tank. But yeah, that could, that could work. Michael Hatcher says, what's your favorite oddball fish? Well, I guess it depends on what you cl uh, qualify as oddball. There are quite a few that I like, but um, if this counts, archer fish. Totally want to do clouded archerfish someday, or basically any archerfish. The reason why I think about clouded archerfish is because they're not brackish water fish. I would love to do a very, very large tank with uh, mangroves. Um, so set it up as a paludarium where the top two or three feet of this really huge tank just have the mangroves growing up in a small grove. And then underneath you have the um, fish swimming, um, the, the clouded archerfish swimming underneath and feed them crickets and things like that by putting them on the leaves and watching them shoot it off. I have fed archer fish before. In fact, I made a video about it, but they weren't my own. I just thought it was the greatest thing. And what I did was put shrimp, they were like uh, small shrimp, like mysa shrimp or something like that, put them on the glass and the fish would spit them off. And it was really amazing to watch them do that. I just thought, someday, my bucket list, I want archer fish in a huge tank with a mangrove paludarium. So if that, I hope that helps answer the question. And Giselle Moraga says, thanks, and yes, you pronounced my last name right. Good. Mikiam, hello, welcome. How's it going? I'm enjoying my uh, millipedes that I got from you, and uh, the, the ivory millipedes, it's amazing how much they stay together and how active they are during the day. That's awesome. I think the other ones are undergoing a mass molt right now, the Spirostreptus species one. So having fun with them. Yeti Grant says, hey, gotta go, keep up the good work, you always have helpful information. Well, thanks for joining us and hope to see you again, and I really appreciate that positive feedback. And Mr. Snake says, I know it isn't too moist, I do have a big water bowl in there, plenty big to soak in, the substrate is pretty dry, I do mist it every once in a while when I see the substrate is dry. Wow. Well, that's an interesting problem that you've got there. If it's, if it's not too dry, then I'm not sure what to tell you there, um, but it does sound... Uh, a little puzzling. That it, I'm glad it's not too dry. I mean, that's good. I mean, it's not too moist. That's good. Uh, but I'm not sure what is causing it then. Vexing Cat says, I still have any of my spider photos. I will send them to you. I should have a couple decent Phidippus audax photos, mostly cross spiders. Cool. Yeah, I'd like to check it out. Mickey M says, my species one adults are always out and very active. Yeah, my, my one adult is, is pretty active too and is out a lot. Um, the babies I have not seen much of. Uh, I saw one up molting against the side, and I figured, oh, okay, everybody's, uh, everybody's molting. I haven't seen them yet uh, surface for a while, so hopefully they do soon. I'm sure they're doing well, but um, yeah. The, it seem, it's interesting to me that some species are more active at different life cycles, or different stages of their life cycle. Like my flame legs were not very surface active at certain ages, but once they became older, they were like always at the surface. Potato Derp says, I joined the mantis keeping hobby recently because overall they are great pets. They're fascinating, easy to raise and breed, and best of all, they are very smart and actually interact with you. Yeah, that, they are really uh, amazing among insects for the degree with which they'll, they'll interact in their apparent intelligence. I agree. Mr. Snake says, the substrate is a topsoil sand cocoa fiber cocoa chip, makes it stays dry and it holds the burrow as well. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, is your steak, snake still eating and active? Has it got a lot of like blisters or things? What, what's going on with it? 
Potato drip says mantids actually look you in the eye and are interested in, in you. A lot of other insects are just like, ah, go away, dumb human, don't eat me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like a lot of insects just uh, seem afraid of humans, but yeah, I, I think mantids do interact with us in a very fascinating way. Nancy C says, hey Russ, I just rescued a leopard gecko and will be revisiting your bioactive build. Cool, cool. Um, thank you for rescuing that leopard gecko. There are a lot of leopard geckos out there in substandard situations. I'm glad to hear that yours, this one you rescued, is going to be in a better situation. Um, just a little update on that bioactive build. Uh, the plant that I put in the front, that calancho, the, the big leaved plant, I just had to remove it recently because it just kept cramming up against the top. And so I put it in a pot outside of the tank because I'm just tired of having to deal with that. It, it was uh, shading the other plants so much that one of the other plants, the Haworthia, which is my favorite plant in the vivarium actually, um, was not getting enough light and it died. So um, I took the Calancho out. I'm going to be putting another Haworthia in. And this is my dream. I hope to do this. I don't know when I'm going to be able to do it. So I have so many projects that I would love to do, but limited funds. But anyway, what I would love to do with it is put, uh, get a 29 gallon, and start over. I can still use the same substrate. The substrate is still in good condition. And put the, the plants that are in there, in there and everything. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to get some more wood and things like that and kind of make a terrace set up and get a wider, a longer um, LED light. Do a couple of things like that. So I think it'll look a lot cooler because we're going to get the, the visual depth of the vivarium and it's going to add um, more interest for the gecko in terms of surfaces to climb over and so on, and a lot more plant growth uh, because with the light all along the back, I'm going to be able to grow more plants and give more height to those plants so I have more choices in terms of plants. So those are some things I, I hope to be able to do soon, but uh, in, in terms of the substrate and how it works bioactively, I'm really happy with it. In fact, it's really amazing how quickly the feces are totally destroyed. The other day when I was digging in it and you know making some changes, um, there were a whole bunch of zebra pill bugs in there, and there are also quite a few of the uh, powder blues, but I was amazed by the number of zebra pill bugs that were in there hiding in the cork bark and so on. So it's, it's working really well, and I hardly ever see feces at all because the mealworms, the powder blues, and the zebra pill bugs take care of it. The Nature Show says, when are you going to get a queen ant? I might have to persuade my wife because I have had one before. I had a colony for about three years. But ants aren't exactly her favorite. They're not exactly prohibited either, though, so maybe I'll get to do that sometime again soon. It was really fun, that colony that I had. Nancy C says, how often are you watering your plants in the tanks? I am notorious for killing succulents. Well, that is definitely a concern, and um, this is what I'm shooting for. Is Often I'll water by dumping out the water dish and then refilling it with clean water. And... So it's probably about half a cup because the water dish isn't that big. Um, I would say something like that. It varies because as the seasons change, it changes. But I would say if you can stick your hand into the soil, your finger into the soil, and the first half inch to an inch is dry, but then you feel it moist underneath, you're golden. That's where you want to be. If you touch it and the top of the soil is moist, overwatering. If you stick it in and it's dry all the way down to an inch and then you stick it in, wiggle another inch or so under and it's still dry, definitely need to water again. So that's what I would say. If you're right in that zone where half an inch to an inch under, you start to feel a little moist, not damp, damp, but a little moist, that's where you want to be. So hopefully that helps. Okay. And that, that will help uh, protect your succulents. I would say for some of the really sensitive succulents, like how worthy is, you might want to put them in a higher terraced area of the vivarium so that their roots have a chance to go down deeper before they encounter that moisture. That might be good. Brubby TV says, what companion inverts would you suggest might live well with isopods? Hmm. Well, let's see. What do I keep with isopods? Invert wise. Millipedes don't necessarily do well with them. They can, but sometimes the millipedes get eaten when they molt. Um, let's see. Some people keep, well, I'm trying to think. I keep tailless whip scorpions with isopods. You can keep vinegarins with isopods. What else? Some people keep snails with isopods. A lot of people keep hermit crabs and isopods together. Um. 
<laughs> so there are others too. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on that, but we'll see. Elaine Smith says, Queen Ant is your gift to yourself for Father's Day. <laughs> Mark Osborne says, Hello, Russ. Hello from Hydra H-E double exclamation point. Yeah, how is that going? We've been having a, uh, some communication about this. Um, uh, his Hydra situation, it, it seems to be going better, but um, he got a surprise bonus of Hydra along with some Java Moss, which is, of course, the surprise we don't really want. But yeah, how is that going? Mr. Snake says he she is eating normally. This is about his ribbon snake, not very active, although there has been improvement. It recently shed its skin in their open lesions. Mm. Hmm. Trying to think. And does it have a basking spot? And do you have like rock work or any place like that where it can completely dry off? And even if the soil is not too wet, I'm wondering about that. Okay. So, yes, you do have a basking spot, and you've got rock work where it can dry off completely. Hmm. I wonder where you could get some more specific advice on that. There, there are some good forms out there for reptiles, but I haven't um, frequented a lot of places with, uh, specifically for snakes. So if anybody has any recommendations where you might get some more specific advice for his ribbon snake and its fungal disease, that would be great. Oh, I just looked at the uh, clock and realized, uh, the timer rather, and realized what time it was. Uh, I've, I probably ought to cut it short and once we get to 40 minutes, I'm gonna have to cut it because I have to film another video, I have to clean out the cricket bin, I have to do 97 things. But I'm really excited that uh, today has been so successful. We have 20 likes so far. There are 21 in the chat right now, and we've had even higher numbers at certain points. So that has been awesome. We've got a lot of good questions and comments. And if you have any more, this is the time. If you haven't hit the like button yet and you would like to, go ahead and do that. I love to see that. It's just fun to look up there. Oh, and see people do it just like that. That is awesome. Um, okay. So... Brevy TV says, the cricket bin is the worst. It is indeed. It's, it's probably the most onerous task I have in my critter room is cleaning out the cricket bin. It takes a while. I have to do it every week. And I'm always, you know, always have to deal with dead crickets and, and things like that. And nearly always lose a cricket. At some point it hops out. At least one. Um, even if I get help, help helps. But Hmm. Mr. Snake says, snake fungus isn't a very common disease and it's a fairly new disease, so I can't really find anything on it. Well, I've even read about cases of it a long time ago, but most of those cases that I read about were because of the, the wet substrate, so I'm, hmm, I'm interested about that. So, Tony Upholstery 23 says, did you put a link for that CO2 generator? Did I put a link on the video itself, on the initial one? I'm not sure. I need to. Um... I will try to find where that is. Um, try to find a link on that because I, I got it from Amazon, so I'll, I'll try to put a link up. Uh, I have been pretty pleased with it so far, and I think I've learned how to control the flow better uh, just by moving the magnet up and down, so it moves the siphon up and down in the, the citric acid solution. I'll, I think I need to make some more mix today, but this will be the second time I've had to do it since, which isn't bad. So, yeah, it's going well. Mark Osborne says, no new free swimmers. A few on the sponge filter that will get swap, swapped out later this evening. Cool. So that's, that's good to hear. So definitely decreasing. Vexing Cat says, emailing any photos I can find. I lost most of my photos a few years back. Oh, I hate it when that happens. I've done that a few times myself. But yeah, I'll look forward to seeing those. Thank you for doing that. And... Mr. Snake says you should try to convince your wife to let you get and breed dubia roaches, much better than crickets. And Brubby TV says I moved to Red Runners. Yeah, I totally wish I could move to roaches. I've worked with roaches. I used to work with um, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches, and I actually liked them. I thought they were cool. I would be comfortable doing that, but my wife will not. So she will not... Uh, let me do it. <laughs> and that's okay. So leopard gecko 05 says, what is the best food for dart frogs? Well, I think most people 
use uh, flightless fruit flies as the staple diet and it's good to vary it quite a bit. Of course, that's supplemented with a vitamin mineral supplement, generally with a calcium supplement and then a vitamin supplement as well. I've been using the, uh, what is it, Rapashi Calcium Plus, which is a mineral, a calcium and vitamin supplement. It's, it's a good one. That's my main supplement that I use, although I also use their vitamin A supplement. I think it's called Vitamin Vita A Plus or something like that. Um, and so, um, I, that's the main staple food. I also use um, confused flower beetle larvae, which are great um, as a, a food to vary their diet. Um, just the larvae, not the beetles. Um, bean beetles are another good food uh, that I have used in the past. And then, of course, they do eat some of the springtails and isopods in the vivarium, so it's good to add those once in a while as well. Um, because they're always, you know, kind of decimating the population. So adding those once in a while is good as well. As much variation as possible in the diet, of course, is, is a good thing. But flies can be a great staple. And then Potato Drip says, got it. Always check notifications at 7-ish where I live on Tuesday. Hopefully I don't miss the next one. Yep, that is the way it goes. Um, the, I do these at 5.30 U.S. Mountain Time on Tuesdays as often as I can. So um, that's something to you know, make sure you're aware of. I try to put out a notification before I actually do it. I don't always get that done, but I try to. So, and Leopard Gecko says, Leopard Gecko 5 says, where do you get isopods? Well, a lot of people get them from me. Uh, you can get them from Bugs in Cyberspace, RoachCrossing.com, CaptiveIsopoda.com, or a couple of places you can find them. Uh, those are all uh, pretty good places. I think Roach Crossing has been sort of um, off the grid for a little while and now is back. Space is always uh, available and CaptiveIsopoda.com um, seems to, you know, very responsive too. Um, and I've had good experiences with both of them. Uh, how much are they? Isopods vary in price a lot. The cheapest culture you can get is usually about $5 and that's for some of the more prolific dwarf species. The more expensive ones can be up to $12 each isopod. Uh, so I paid $120 for a culture of my, my titans, but that is uh, one of the more expensive hobby species. Generally, you're gonna pay between five and $15 for most species, for a starter culture of most species. And that is usually between a dozen and two dozen per culture, depending on the species. Some of the dwarf species usually get like 24 for $5, something like that. Potato Derp says, how nutritious are isopods? I would imagine they wouldn't be a good food source for predatory insects. Well, that's a good question. They do have some calcium in them, but of course insects don't necessarily need as much calcium as you know, reptiles and amphibians do. Um, and I don't know how many studies have been done on how much protein and things like that they have. Certainly their carapace is pretty, pretty hard. And Mark Osborne says, Rush, shrimp tank lots of buried females last few weeks, no babies, but notice the snail population is up. Related? Do snails inhibit or eat shrimplets? Um, not in my experience. There could be something else going on, some sort of interaction between the snails and the shrimp. Um, possibly if the snail population is up, uh, some things that come to mind, possibly calcium in the water is being reduced because the snails are sequestering it for their shells. Um, could be that they are breeding more and using up more of the food resources and so the, the shrimp are not getting as much to eat when they're shrimplets, and there, there are a couple of possibilities there. But as far as I have seen, in my experience, I've raised lots of snails and shrimp together without a problem. Could be uh, something to do with the, the number of snails changing the water quality balance as well, possibly. I mean, I'm sure you have good water quality in your tank, but there could be some interaction there as well. Mr. Snake says, my dog sees a rabbit outside and is barking her head off. Hmm. Well, um, I would probably do the same if I were a dog, but that's cool. Um, we don't see a lot of rabbits around here where I live. Um, you, where, where do you, you live that you get to see rabbits outside? Man, that's, that's a pretty, that would be quite surprising for us to see one in our area. Leopard Gecko 5 says, what is the best type of dart frogs? Um, Mark Osborne says, thanks. Well, I hope, I hope that was helpful. I, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything more that I could say, but 
Did you have a lot of shrimplets before and now you don't? Or it's just you've had buried females and then you're not seeing them? Mm. And then, let's see. Um, what is the best type of dart frogs? Well, I would say it depends on what you like, of course. But dart frogs that are good for beginners, one of the best species, and the species that I have right now, is uh, the Leucomelus, Dendrobates Leucomelus, or the bumblebee dart frog. They're a little more forgiving than some of the other types and hardy, so that's a good species to start with. And Matt Kelly says, I'm giving Daphne a try. I have so many different ways to raise them. And the key is to not overfeed and keep the population down. Do you agree? Any other tips? Definitely overfeeding is worse than underfeeding. Uh, and keep removing individuals from the population. That will help. Yep. Uh, let's see. Aeration without an air stone. Very important. Uh, a little aeration. Bit of a trickle. Um, no, um, no air stone. Otherwise the bubbles are too small and trap them. So... Uh, yeah, that, that, there's a couple of tips there. Hopefully that helps. And potato derp, when can you raise Thamnocephalus platyurus again, the beaver tail fairy shrimp? I'm hoping to do that this summer. Okay, and Mark Osborne says, just buried females, no babies yet. Okay. Um, well, if you start seeing the females without babies, but you don't see any babies, then you definitely have a problem. Um, this is not the same tank with the hydra in it, is it? Because that that just uh, can be a, like a warning light if you are seeing buried females and no babies. Um, I don't think that would be the case, but it can be. I mean, I've heard of that happening, where they're disappearing, the babies are disappearing, the shrimplets are disappearing because of the hydra. But okay, no hydra in the tank, good. Triopster says, can Daphnia live in green water? Yes, they can, it does happen. Um, sometimes the pH shifts of green water from day and night can be a problem for Daphnia, but uh, Daphnia can live in green water, but what they will do eventually is clear it up. So some people have actually introduced Daphnia into tanks in order to clear them up, and it does work, uh, and there are various ways to do it. If you have fish, they're going to eat the Daphnia. Some people have actually put Daphnia in a fine mesh breeder trap in their tank, and they'll go to town in there just filtering the water from the, the green uh, water and get all that algae out of the water. So they can, but eventually they will destroy the green water by eating it. Powerful Linens, welcome! Good to see you here. Okay, so no hydrant in the tank, Mark says. And let's see what else is going on in there, I think. And with shrimp, it's, a, it's an interesting balance because you want to maintain the right amount of hardness, not too much, not too little. Um, and then you said they were cherry shrimp. So, Robert Gear, bye and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm thinking... That, that's something to ponder. Let me think about that a little bit more, too. But hopefully you will be seeing babies soon. And if not, if you're seeing the females reappearing, you know, and you can tell that they have recently been buried, but you've not seen any babies, then we know that for sure there's a problem. So right now it just might be a little early to, to see the shrimplets. Leopard Gecko 5 says, How often, how much fruit flies or pinheads do you feed the bumblebee dart frogs? Oh, that's another thing I do feed my dart frogs on occasion. Pinhead crickets. Because I usually have some on hand. Uh, I usually feed them every other day or so, depending. Uh, if there, I find that there are more flies sitting in the tank, I don't feed them again. Uh, and just maybe a couple of dozen flies per frog, more or less. Depends also if I'm giving Hydei, maybe a few less. And if I'm giving Melanogaster, which are smaller, a little more. All right, well, oh, I have gone pretty long, but thank you for joining us, everyone. I really, really appreciate it, and it's been a fun live stream for me, and I hope to see you at the next one. Always Tuesdays, 5.30, whenever I'm able to do it, that's when I do it, and uh, I will have another video for you on Friday. See you later.